So this was incredible, and uh, uh, I should have mentioned, but uh, I, mean, I would like to mention now that uh, Vivek Shetty, who is our moderator, he himself uh, has a lot of work-life balance, so wisdom that comes out from him, we should really uh, appreciate that. So he is a clinician, he sees patients, he is a wonderful academic that uh, he, he puts together amazing grants. Uh, most of the grants that he has put together, I don't think that many of them have been turned down. And then he has been uh, president of UCLA Faculty Senate. Then he is uh, <laughs> associate vice chancellor for research. So there are so many hats that he uh, wears and still manages to raise kids. So, <laughs> so he has uh, so he has an amazing experience. So we are very fortunate to have him as a moderator. So thus far, we had we heard from our panelists who uh, um, spoke from an academic vantage point. That means being uh, I mean, their primary job being a scientist and balancing that with their other responsibilities. Next panel, we have our other career paths. So that uh, very few of us get to experience. We have Dr. Eric Fain, who has who started a company, sold that to St. Jude Medical, then was a group president at St. Jude Medical, then sold that to Abbott and was the group president at Evot, and he is now taking little time off uh, to reflect as to what he wants to do next. So amazing set of experiences that very few us, a few of us get to experience or will get to experience. Uh, second, we have Dr. Ed Ramos. Uh, he is a program director at uh, from NIH. Again, a career that very few of us have experience with, so it would be great to hear his experiences at this young age. He is uh, he's a division director at an IBIB. He oversees very high profile programs from NIH that includes many uh, 10 plus million dollar or even 100 plus million dollar grants from NIH. So he has a very broad perspective of I mean, large scale initiatives. And then we have our president of our university, Dr. David Rudd. He has been an amazing supporter of the MD2K program. But, uh, but here he's, uh, he's speaking from his experience as being on the fast track. He uh, was a dean before coming to University of Memphis. He joined us as a provost, and within a few years, he became a president. And within a few years, he has made Memphis uh, reach such great heights in terms of making large-scale changes and improvements, uh, in, in improving enrollments, improving the, uh, the life of many of the faculty, students, and, and staff throughout the campus. So we are very fortunate to have uh, our next three panelists, and we would love to hear their experiences and their advice for uh, graduate students who are graduating or for younger faculty who still have career choices ahead of them. So let's welcome our three panelists. So let me begin by again thanking our panelists for coming. This this is an incredible opportunity. It's uh, when you're in the trenches, you don't think you think of life as as, as, as existential. It's a day-to-day -day grind. When you are a president or at the level that they are in, you get that 40,000 uh, view of the university. It's very humbling, but it's also very enriching. And the decisions you make, uh, your actions shape the careers of so many young, uh, you know, aspiring academics or people who want to go into industry. So I'm very grateful that we could attract all, all of them. Let's begin with President Rudd. I know you have a tight schedule. Tell us a little. Uh, about your journey to president and beyond? Um, well, I, you know, it's an interesting uh, process. I, I don't know that uh, this was actually ever what I wanted to do. Uh, and um, I started uh, as a um, psychologist, so I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. I practiced uh, full time. I was on a medical school staff for 10 years. Um, I had served in the military as a clinical psychologist for five years uh, during the Gulf War. Um, and that, that really was the expectation that I would continue to be a clinical psychologist. So I practiced about 15 years uh, in a tertiary care uh, medical center and with a medical school. Uh, and the reason I went back to academics really wasn't my initiative. It actually was the initiative of my wife. Uh, she wanted to go back and get a doctorate and we explored ways to make that happen. Uh, and the best alternative was for me to go back into academics. And, and uh, as a result, I did. Now, I was a active researcher uh, when I was on the medical school staff and, and as a clinician. So I'd always published um, and did clinical trials. Um, and, and really, um, I ended up in this position, kind of a random set of occurrences. Um, I became a department chair, 
which is the most difficult job in the world. Uh, and uh, if you if you see your department chair, say thank you, um, even if you don't like them, because those are really tough jobs. Um, and uh, I ended up um, moving a little bit after she finished so that we could both have faculty positions. So I chaired a number of departments. Um, ended up uh, being recruited to be a dean. Uh, it was ended up being a very attractive position to me for a lot of different reasons and for Loretta for a lot of different reasons. One is I love to ski. Uh, and it took me to a place where I could ski 70 to 80 times a year. So we were in Utah for, for five years uh, and do some great science, which we did uh, and really enjoyed it. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, we, we ended up coming back here uh, partly because our son was out here. Uh, and we wanted to be closer to our son, uh, who was out at Vanderbilt. And um, and so, you know, you have these plans. I guess my comment would be you have these plans. Um, and, um, you know, the one thing that I, I, I look back on, and I've, I've missed opportunities to be inconvenienced um, that would have made um, that would have been made for a more interesting career, more interesting life. But when I've allowed myself to be inconvenienced, life was a lot more interesting. And I, I would encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to be inconvenienced by something, because you never know where it's going to take you. I I, I think you know we we have some exceptionally talented uh, graduate students here, and others following us on blue jeans, uh, and some of them are destined to be university presidents. 15, 20 years, what kind of skills and experience would you recommend that they start uh, garnishing it along to prepare them for this uh, job without description? Yeah, you know, I, I would tell you, um, I never would have thought being a clinical psychologist would be helpful as an administrator, but it's remarkably helpful. Uh, and, <laughs> it, it, I, you know, it, it, and it, it is incredibly helpful, not because um, I do clinical work, uh, in this job, but because clinical work helped me understand people, um, and it helped me understand myself, and and, um, and I, I think one of the things really is to to understand that this job is unlike being a professor, being a being a uh, a uh, researcher, because it is entirely about people, um, and everything that you do in this job is about people. Uh, everything that we do at the leadership level affects people. Um, in very concrete ways, in very abstract ways, and and if you don't enjoy working with people, in, and I would suggest if you don't enjoy working with people that are upset, it's not the place to go. Uh, and because most of what I do is deal with upset uh, outside, in in terms of day to day, what gets what gets what gets profiled is the upset. What makes a difference is the strategy uh, and the strategic efforts that we make. So I think really the opportunity to deal with people uh, is something that you really need to enjoy, recognize the importance of it. Um, and I would encourage you, these are particularly important jobs because of people. Um, you know, the things that, um, the things that make it difficult if you don't develop patience, uh, it's a tough job. Um, and I've not always been very patient in my life, and, and having children and now having grown children really helped me uh, develop uh, a, pay, a sense of patience in my perspective. And to recognize that when I talk about strategy, I'm talking about it's not step one, it's step 20. And it's seen step 20 when you see step one. I, I, as a researcher, I never thought that way. And, and but I do think that way now. I mean, I, when we look at taking a step, and, and if you ask me to support an initiative, I'm not going to be concerned just about your initiative. I'm going to be concerned about everything it touches in the next five, 10 steps that we can launch off of that initiative to generate resources uh, for our students and for what we do and for this community. And so it's just a different perspective and the capacity to develop that kind of flexibility later in life is really important uh, because you won't, it won't be the same perspective. I think differently uh, as a president than I thought as a provost, I thought differently as a provost than I thought as a, as a, as a dean, and I thought profoundly differently uh, as a chair. And what makes a good chair doesn't make a good dean, doesn't make a good provost, and doesn't make a good president. And if you don't change, you won't be good at those jobs. So uh, you, you have this 40,000 view of the university, and uh, both as a president and uh, as a clinical psychologist, you can see train wrecks developing oh, yeah. and uh, so what are the common mistakes you see people 
uh, making again and again, who are you know trying to set up the university with Mr. Dupont. Yeah, you can see the train wrecks coming. Sometimes you can't avoid them, and sometimes they're they're needed. I mean, sometimes train wrecks are needed to make progress, and and um, and are really essential. And, and I think that um, you know, I think that that probably um, that probably really uh, is a part of it. I, you know, the the, the capacity to uh, the capacity to do that, um, and to be able to, and, and, and really to be able to maneuver um, uh, the best you can uh, around those issues. But I don't know that you can you can ever uh, you can ever get away uh, uh, from from some of the train wrecks as a part of the process. Um, you know, um, when you look at um, when you look at um, the most essential element uh, for for a president, um, I think, is the capacity to communicate good and bad, uh, the capacity to be transparent, and the, the capacity not to take any of this personally. So I don't take the successes personally. I don't take the, the failures personally because I recognize that there are hundreds and thousands of people that are involved in every single piece of what we do, um, and, and that's really critical. The, the, the question actually also leads to uh, when you are in university administration. Uh, when you're a train wreck, there is collateral damage to the university. And as a president, I'm sure you wake up every morning hoping it's a good day if I'm not in the front page of the local paper. Yeah. And so, how, how do you how do you insulate yourself? You know. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that you do though. I mean, I you know I think a part of it um, is um, because you know, part of the issue is is the visibility and how you leverage the visibility uh, for the university and for what we do. Um, so if you look at a vibrant university is a university life that's going to be conflictual. Um, and, and, you know, I was talking with some students this morning about some things they were upset about. The fact that they're upset about it and talking with me is really important. It's a good, healthy sign for the university as a whole. So I don't know that it's, I don't know it's as much as not wanting to be on the front page of the newspaper because that's not going to happen um, in many ways because there are agendas that are going to drive you to the front page of the newspaper. Um, I do think it is how do you respond to that and, and how do you leverage that in the best interest of the university and, and overall visibility for the university. Um, and I, I really believe in transparency. Uh, the problem with transparency is sometimes people hear what they don't want to hear. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think that really is critical. If you're going to, you know, a, a vibrant, healthy university is one that people own. And as you know, in any, any, uh, any good uh, organization with a lot of smart people, people disagree. And owning that as a part of the culture and understanding that is good to disagree. Uh, you know, you look at the people that I've hired since I've been here, it's people that disagree with me because that's how you make good decisions, get good things to happen. And so, um, it, but it's helping people understand what that means, why that's important, why that's good visibility. Um, and then we can leverage that to our benefit. I mean, I, we've got a few things coming down the road that, that you don't know about that won't be shared and, and are, they're not even on the radar right now that are going to be issues that get a lot of attention here that we will leverage and use to our benefit. I mean, I will tell you that, you know, racial conflict in Memphis is a part of the history of this culture. It's part of the history of this city. It's a part of the history of the U.S. And I will tell you, we've taken that head on. We've embraced that as a part of our mission, a part of our identity. And we have had wonderfully productive discussions, outcomes, interventions, um, and uh, and I think uh, that has raised the visibility and, and the overall value of what we do as an educational institution. And the last thing I'd say is, remember, this is all about education. I was in, in a meeting this morning complaining to some people um, about the way something was handled, and uh, and I, I can get pretty animated. And I told them, I said, you got to understand, we're all here to be educated. And everything we do ought to be viewed from that lens. Um, what I do, I ought to learn, you ought to learn, and, and if we do that, we're going to be a great university. So, and, so universities are places of uh, common good, and that's a wonderful platform to have. So, and what kind of traits are, uh, do you recommend to people who would be most successful in that kind of forum or environment? Um, well, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I think that I, I think there's a range of traits. I mean, I I, I do think that the 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 one thing that uh, makes it uh, difficult in my job is one you have to you have to um, 
be willing to be out front, whether you want to be out front or not. And I don't like necessarily being out front. I was a therapist. I saw people individually in my office and that's what I did. And I loved doing that. Uh, and I love publishing. Um, and, but it, you've got to be out front. And, and, and so that's important, but I also think that it's recognizing it's not you. Uh, it's an institution and that you represent an institution. You represent a lot of people. Um, and so uh, every time we have a success and every time we have a failure, um, it's understanding that it represents all of these people. And, and really, again, comes back to the idea of how do we learn, how do we grow from all those experiences. So I think, I think certainly humility is important um, uh, in, a, in a critical variable. We've actually, in our, in our leadership team office, we have the values that we have uh, as an organization on the wall. Um, and I think at the heart of that is that we make decisions based on values. I mean, if you bring me a tough decision, I'm not going to really argue money with you. I'm not going to argue. We're first going to look at it and say, is it consistent with the values of who we are? And I would take the University of Memphis. We, have, we very clearly have foundation, history, and values that are constant with what we do. And, it, and if we are going to make a decision that is contrary to those values, we are, we are making a mistake. And that we have to revisit those values every time we do it. And I think willingness to do that. Uh, is really important. Um, and in order for that to happen, you got to be comfortable enough with who you are. I mean, I, you know, many of you, uh, if you're here at this university, you know our history and you know the, the times we've done well and the times we've done poorly. Um, and you might disagree with me on some things or many things, but I would tell you that I'd be comfortable with that because I'm comfortable with the decisions that I make. And ultimately, it's not about the job. I love being a faculty member and would welcome the chance to teach again and do those things. If the job becomes too important, you lose perspective. So many, many of our graduate students, you know, they have spouses, they are dual careers, looking for academic positions or in industry. Uh, at least from a university president's perspective, what kind of uh, uh, opportunities exist? How do you handle dual career? Uh, people applying for positions yeah, both we, in administration and academia. We, we've tried to, I mean, we do that on an individual basis. We've never uh, actively recruited. When I was at Texas Tech, uh, anybody been to Lubbock? Yeah, Lubbock is six hours from anything. Uh, and uh, and so in Lubbock, uh, Lubbock actually has a very well publicized dual uh, uh, career program. That's actually why how I ended up there is uh, my wife finished her degree. We ended up there. We recruited there because we both wanted faculty positions and, and wanted careers. And they had a very specific program. Not a lot of universities have that, but I would tell you that we work on an individual basis to make that happen. Um, we're, you know, universities with, with more expansive resources are able to do it uh, a little bit easier, but every little thing counts. I mean, I, we just passed, uh, our board just passed a uh, parental leave uh, policy that will allow parents and partners uh, to have leave when they have a, a child paid leave uh, in addition to uh, unpaid time off. It'll be a paid leave policy. And all of those little things matter for, for staff and faculty uh, and, and, and graduate students that are working uh, uh, as well. And, and that really is important. So we're, we're, we're just going to take it one step at a time and try and reinforce that. But, you know, I tell you, that comes back to value. So it comes back to the, the reality that that kind of a value is what drives those practical uh, strategic decisions. Perfect. So I, I know you have a busy, uh, compacted schedule. So let's ask you one very yeah. key question is what advice would you give to your 30 year old self? Um, boy, that, you know, that is a, um, that is a tough uh, question. Um, you know, probably, um, you know, I, I, I referenced it earlier um, about being inconvenienced. Um, earlier in life, I was less patient um, and grateful that we didn't have children early in life. We, we were married for over a decade before we had kids because I'd have been a horrible parent because um, I was impatient. Um, I think one of the reasons I was a good scientist is I was impatient. Uh, and but one of the worst qualities for an administrator is to be impatient. Uh, and so, um, I, you know, I would have encouraged myself to be more patient. And then I'm going to connect it to what I said earlier. And a part of what comes with, with patience is understanding that inconvenience is a good thing. 
that when people have inconvenienced me, I've often benefited more and had had more opportunity. And I look back on decisions that I made early in my career that I thought, oh, that's incredibly inconvenient. I'm not going to do that. And then five years later, I said, oh, that's the worst decision I've ever made. I passed up on an opportunity. Um, I, I will tell you, I, I had an opportunity to, when I was a graduate, when I was a uh, a, a young graduate student, uh, I didn't understand the significance of one of the people I was working with because he was just a great guy. Uh, I didn't know how well known he was globally, and I didn't understand the impact of his work. And and because um, I, I was a first year graduate student, he invited me to do some things at Oxford and to have an opportunity uh, to do that. Um, and I passed on it. Um, and he paused when I passed on it and said, Why don't you think about that for a week? And um, and then I came back the next week and he said, did you give us some additional thought? And, and I did. And, and I thought, God, how inconvenient this would be for me to go do this in the middle of all this other stuff I'm doing that I think is so great. Um, would have been the best move I'd ever made uh, if I'd done it. Um, and I regretted it. Uh, and I contacted him after, well, after I was out of graduate school and talked to him about it. And, and it was so funny uh, when I mentioned it, he said, yeah, he said, you know, I really thought about, God. Really, that's an idiotic decision, uh, and um, but it came from a patient. It came from a place not of hubris. It came from a place of impatience. I just was really pushing hard and missing a lot. And I know that sounds contradictory, but um, it, I learned a lot from that experience, and I learned to slow down a little bit um, and realize that that producing all the time isn't the best thing. <laughs> That there's opportunity, you miss opportunities to learn and grow when you're worried about production all the time. Perfect. This is uh, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, don't always have a university president uh, visiting, us, so this is a good time if you have any questions. Yeah, and if you don't like to raise money, don't become a university president. <laughs> <laughs> so, because <laughs> that's about ninety percent. This, this, uh, we are very grateful you made time yeah, for absolutely. us to come I mean, Jeff, and I want to thank you on behalf of all of us who are not denizens of the University of Memphis, uh, far away universities, but we really enjoy and appreciate the support that you're thrown behind Santosh and and his team, uh, because really it's become evolved into a national resource, and we, other than those plane rides that make we have to change airports, we come gladly to <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 flying in out of Memphis is never the easiest thing in the world. Uh, I, look, well, let me just say thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing. I mean, this really is remarkable. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of investment that universities make that, that the, the reach and the benefit extends globally. Uh, and it's just such a pleasure uh, to be a part of it. Uh, and this is a part of what you have to love about academics. I mean, this is just a fabulous, uh, it's a fabulous opportunity for everyone involved and particularly us. So we're, we're really pleased to be a part of it, uh, pleased to be able to support it and, and grateful for the opportunity uh, to support it. We cut out.